Bible mashing. Okay. All right. Um, last Sunday, I published my first ebook, um, and what that involved was formatting an EPUB um, package and uploading it to Lulu. Um, and the walk and the walk. The book is a short walk. I did a guided walk through Annandale. Um, it's a historical walk. So um, I'll just click on there. So that's it. Available. Um, no, that's my plug for it. And this is it available on on uh, Lulu. So it's eight ninety nine, which is US, and that's um, uh, this could be bad. Um, Oh, okay. Um, that that that's the price. Uh, Lulu. I don't know why we've got. Ah, um, oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so, what's involved in publishing an EPUB, an uh, ebook? Um, you have to collect your content, and I actually write raw HTML, and after bothering to do it in open office and then exporting the XHTML, I would recommend writing it in raw HTML. Clean HTML is the best way to go. Um, or XHTML if you're fluent in that. And then use Tidy and W3C to verify your um, XHTML. And then the next stage after you've got that all working and looking good is um, is to format it into into the package, so you have each of the pages and the graphics and, and the images separate. Um, and the EPUB package has got a, a MIME type file, a um, meta inf file, and um, then another folder with all the um, with all with all the doc with all your um, pages of with the content basically. So those are just like web pages. Um, and there's a couple of extra files which um, define, which I've actually missed there now, there's uh, two extra files which define the format of the document and the f format of the package. Now, what I might actually go back is and go over this because this is what was discussed on Slug today and I, it was really very useful um, feedback, was that, I mean, when I created the EPUB, I actually just cheated took an existing EPUB file, stripped out the other files and put mine in because I couldn't get this MIME type to work. And so that's the secret to getting your MIME type to work is creating, um, put it, zipping the MIME type into, the, into your EPUB file or your zip file with that minus zero, which makes it uncompressed. And then that minus X, which um, avoids sticking the extra line feed, which, um, uh, makes the file fa um, fail validation, and then after that, basically, um, before you can up, you can. The idea is so you, in th in this case, you're doing your own formatting of the document. Lulu will do that if you like as an alternative, and you can just upload a PDF. But the next uh, stage after that is you have to actually validate um, validate the file. Um, so that it um, it meets Lulu's um, well, in fact, the EPUB format, and that's um, managed to lose that. I've left out that link, but there's a there's a link. Um, it's called Three Press, which validates your file, and it's very it's it, they're not very helpful error messages, but b basically it goes through and tells you your file's going to pass and eventually you get it into the right format and you upload it and then Lulu converts it into um, your ebook format and uploads it to iTunes and gives you an ISBN. Any questions? Ah, printing the book will have to be next week's talk because I'm still struggling with that. So this this is this is the ebook version which I uploaded last Sunday, and in fact, 
Well, in theory, you think going from an e-book, which has lots, because I actually put in hyperlinks, that's one excuse. Um, so when you do a printed book, there's of course no hyperlinks, so you need to think about that for the author, um, um, for the readers. So I'm still working through doing the paper version, um, which is uploaded as a PDF, so it's a, it's a different file and it'll have a different ISBN. So that'll be next month. <laughs> yep. Nine, eight seconds. Oh, you might have. It was 1890s Annandale's Short Walk. And it will be available. It's available now on iTunes. On iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on Lulu. There's a new version. Yes, yes. And I even guided the walk last April for the National Trust people who, quite, who were quite impressed, which problem to me to write it up. I mean, I do actually do lots of history. I've got a hu Annandale. If you look up Annandale, you get lots of history and it's all on the web. But this is actually a specific walk with photos and stuff like that. So there you go. Okay, thank you. That's handy, same computer. Okay, we're running on batteries though, that'll be a good test. Uh, okay, I'm cheating a bit, this is actually a, a blog post and I just turned off the formatting to make it look like slides. Are we <laughs> okay, I gave a talk at Slug a um, couple of months ago about uh, buying one of these, which is the Kogan Agora uh, now it's not a netbook, it's bigger than a netbook because it's got 11.6 inch screen, it's, it's a notepad computer um, running different sorts of Linux. And I was a bit down on it at the time, I grumbled a bit, so I thought I'd come back and tell you that it's actually now working quite well. So it's a pretty run of the mill little uh, light little computer. It's called a 12 inch laptop but the screen's actually 11.66 inches. It turns out that's perfect for carrying around because the case of the computer is exactly the same size as an A4 page. And it's, you can put it in your bag and it's like carrying about two um, pads of A4 paper. So it fits very neatly. Uh, it comes in three models. The cheapest one's got the solid state disk um, and that runs Google's Chromium OS and claimed to be the first in the world. Um, and uh, then there's a standard model which has got a bigger disk and I bought the Pro one of course with an even bigger 500 gigabyte disk in, in Bootu, 2 gigabytes of RAM, etc. I kind of wish I had bought the Chromium one simply because it's got the solid state disk and I have much more disk space than I need for a casual user. I'd suggest if you, if you can fit everything into the solid state disk and change the operating system that might be a good way to go. They're all under $400, so they're relatively cheap. They've all got the same Inti um, Intel Pentium processor and the same screen and the same hardware basically. Uh, the battery's a bit light on four cell battery and it's quite a light sort of unit. So Works fine. Sorry, Tom, yep. Uh, you know, they this model, the previous netbook I had, I bought it with an double size battery. The physical design of where the battery is inserted, it looks like you can't fit one. It's a flat plate in the bottom of the unit. So, um, and uh, you know, it runs open source stuff. Had problems when I started it up, it had the Unity um, interface, which pretended to be like a, net, uh, like a um, tablet computer, sort of with big buttons and things, which just drove me mad. And when I increase the font size because I have trouble reading the screen, it just didn't work properly. But all you do is when you're logging in, switch to the Ubuntu Classic user interface and it switches off that interface and it works like an old-fashioned graphical user interface. Uh, the battery was supposed to be three and a half hours. I managed to get two, points, two and three quarter hours out of it by switching off all the power using things. When I was here at the talk, somebody 
told me to install this little utility up here, automatic sleep enabled. A byproduct of that is the battery life seems to have gone up by about half an hour. That seems to be switching on some of the energy saving features that weren't on before and it's actually seems to be running about more than three hours now. So I'm getting enough battery life out of it to make it worthwhile. Um, and of course one of the catches is um, I think basically Kogan put the operating system on it and give it to you and say good luck. You know, the hardware support's okay. I've had a power supply that broke and I got a new one and that was fine, but you, otherwise you're pretty much on your own with this sort of thing. Um, if you need a cheap, light, little netbook sort of computer with a slightly larger screen um, and you're comfortable with um, looking after Linux yourself, uh, seems to work pretty well. And I'm, I was thinking, oh, should I send it back? But now I'm thinking, yeah, oh, it's working fine. The other thing I did was I scraped Kogan off the front of it. <laughs> it was written in large silver letters and I was going to go over it with a texture and when I put the texture on it, the letters came off. So now it sort of hasn't got the brand written across the front. And I put a felt tip pen on the bar that's all shiny here because it's got a few, few shiny things. Um, but apart from that, it's um, an okay little computer I'd suggest try buying the solid state version, putting more RAM in it and a different version of Linux if you want it. Has anybody actually tried the Chromium operating system on this thing? I just, I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable without a real operating system in there somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Very, it's very different thing because you can't quite have a go to a desktop system. Well, the, the, the Unity interface was bad enough for me. It just kept, it just drove me mad. And as soon as I switched it off and I had pull down menus and a desktop in the, where I'd expected and all of that, then I felt quite comfortable. We finished? You can only buy it online? I believe you can only buy it online, yes. They've got a, a store there. Yeah. Um, and I think they've got one of these things where I think they arrive by the container load. And so you order it, it might take weeks to arrive. I'm getting the wind up here. <laughs> Any more questions afterwards? Yeah. Do you want to do something here? Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, and this is all on the web, of course. So Tom's going to lend me his laptop to... We'll see how long the battery lasts. Yeah. Hopefully it lasts more than um, four minutes, yes. Um, let me just fix... Shrita, go. Okay. Um, who knew? You've broken all the formatting. How do I turn them back on? You did. <laughs> hey, style. That was just to get rid of the Google ads. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> I'm an organizer for PyCon AU, um, as you probably know, um, because I've talked about it probably every single slug um, that has happened in the last six months. Um, fun? <laughs> Yeah, I don't have much to talk about. I just have to pad it out a bit, right? Um, so what I wanted to do is give you an idea about what the conference schedule is like. Because um, I know some people kind of thought, oh yeah, I'm not really into Python, I'm a newbie. Um, is there anything there for um, me to, at the conference? And I like to say, yes, there is. Um, who here likes coding under pressure? Um, probably nobody, but it's really fun to watch people do it. Um, so, what's the women in Python breakfast? That's a breakfast for women who are in Python. Um, the Code Wars event is basically there will be, I think, 20 teams competing under pressure to write code as fast as possible. They'll be given some um, topic like 
I don't know, find how many times Juliet is said in Shakespeare and the first person to complete the code um, on the screen or will be projected um, wins. And then it's kind of a round robin and they get points and all that type of thing. So that's a really cool event. Um, you don't have to be coming to PyCon to go to the Code Wars. Um, it's just happening because PyCon's going on. I highly recommend it. It's at a pub. So as the night goes on, the code gets a little bit worse. Um, but, yep. Um, so we have a breakfast for women in Python to network. Um, that's an invitation only event. So if you're not invited, you're not invited, sorry. Um, but we have a keynote from Audrey Roy, which is great. Um, but the thing I wanted to point out was this thing here. If you have never written Python before, this is a great introduction to Python. Um, Peter basically runs a Python training company um, who trains people in Python. So this is a way to get trained from a professional trainer in Python, a great way to start off um, learning about it. It's a kind of a tutorial session, so you can go there and he explains all the basics of Python, all that type of thing. Um, if you're a student, PyCon only cost $44. I don't think you'll find a cheaper way to learn Python from a professional. So sign up. Um, if you want a t-shirt, you need to sign up before August the 1st. Um, that's the deadline for getting t-shirts. Um, Sunday. Yeah, so sign up now. Um, there's lots of other things um, on that are quite interesting. Python 3, if you're using Python, Python 3 is the new version. Um, find out what's happening there. Um, other things like um, the Zena Python, a great um, way if you're like coming from Java or C++. If you want to kind of write your code so it feels like Python, Richard Jones will kind of give you the, here's how to write something that's Pythonic. So um, it's a highly recommended talk. Um, there are lots of other interesting things. Um, so there's a sysadmin versus developers talk. Um, Python for science and engineering. There's a two part session on that. If you're an engineer or a scientist, definitely go and look at that. It's how to use things like NumPy and stuff to make your job easier. Trust me, Python's better than Fortran. Um, <laughs> and there are some other talks that people might find interesting. You can find out how Python is used um, to teach the young and impressionable. Um, Georgina and Katie are talking about that. The NCSS challenge. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend you register and hopefully um, if you can't register, we'll have a recording of all the talks on the left two columns. So you can watch them online for free, but it's so much better to see them in person and you get a cool t-shirt if you sign up this weekend. Thank you very much. I didn't know about this until about 20 minutes ago. Shall I type in tracking amateurs? No, nah, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can take it out and figure out how it goes elsewhere. <laughs> All right. Start whenever you want. Okay, I'll start now then. Okay, so this is just a quick introduction to a little project I'm working on at the moment. Um, Amateur satellites are, as the name would imply, satellites that carry amateur radio signals. Um, quite often used as repeaters to send VHF and UHF signals, which are normally line of sight sort of radio systems. These, by going via satellite, you can send them well over the horizon and all over the world, essentially. 
trouble with this is that to work these satellites, you have to be able to follow them with your highly directional and very powerful antennas. And hence, most people will be using computer controlled uh, antenna aiming systems to do this. The current project I'm working on is to design and build a, a from the ground up, a system to aim these antennas. Um, the plan is to use open source tools and hardware um, for all systems in it. Um, one of the um, sort of limiting factors in this, though, is the very small number of uh, open source CAD programs. So if anyone's you know, a, uh, a design engineer who works in this, I'm happy to speak to you afterwards and find out your recommendations. Because um, CAD on Linux is something that unfortunately is currently the domain of the commercial software. So, um, but yeah. So at the system that we're working on at the moment runs will run two antennas. One's designed for the two meter amateur band, one's for the, for the 70 centimeter. These antennas will be anything up to sort of three or four meters long. Um, so this is, uh, there's quite a bit of weight and a lot of wind resistance to throw these things around. Um, you know, so subsequently, you can't just use a little off-the-shelf radio-controlled model servo. Um, you tend to break them very quickly trying that. Um. <laughs> um, yeah. So all all the programming for these for this system is being done in C. Um, there's no reason for that other than I happen to know how to use C. Um, you could do it in Python if you liked. <laughs> no. <laughs> I said if you can, I'm I welcome that. Um, yeah, it's it. It's just um, being trained as a mechanical engineer. I was I was taught. Pure C, so th there's there was no. I said there's no. When we asked about the size of the antennas, you said a few meters long. Yep. So we're talking about things like yardage. Yes. Yes, we're not. Um, so this is more like a two uh, meter yeah. So what? Than as I said, we're, we're trying to build the whole system from the ground up. So mm -hmm. um, obviously, trying to roll a nice parabolic dish is. Um, Something I'm putting my hand up as being beyond me, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> so I'm not going to try and eyeball a, uh, a parabola out of that, unfortunately. So if you've got a great way to do it, I'm happy to. <laughs> I do provide you. I know of it. I haven't been able to get it to compile properly on my system for some reason. Uh -huh. um, so I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong, but <laughs> as it. Well, put your emphasis up on, on Plug. Yeah. Plug chat and see if we can send you the, you know, yeah. the, what you need with library, what you need. Yeah. You use it, do you? Or? <laughs> Yeah, because I've used the um, yeah, because I've used quite a lot of CAD under Windows, of course, but yeah. But, but also CAD and, and whatever there. But just yeah. for us. Yeah. yeah. So Me, myself, and I. <laughs> Basically, to design the actual mechanism that will do the aiming. So, and how, how do you um, I haven't got. Well, the idea is that I'll have the models 
which will have um, you know the weights figured out on them. So it's a uh, it's a case if you build the solid model and you weight your materials properly, it'll give you your weights, which you can then work backwards, choose motors, and then the whole iterative process of design goes on and on. Okay, the antenna is d going to be what's called a, a, um, a log periodic aerial, which basically is like, imagine a TV aerial, except, you know, three times the length, but it'll also have, rather than just having, say, all your elements that way, there's actually going to be two sets, so that you've actually got a, essentially a cross shape, which runs all the way up the, so, so it's, it's, well, it's not so much the weight of the thing, it's because all the weight is distributed out along a thing, you've then got the uh, you know, the wind trying to reef it around. And yeah, but I'm just saying that's just not, it's mobile in the sense that you can rotate the surface. Yeah. But it's not mobile in the sense that you want to train the back of anywhere with one. Well, I mean, <laughs> you, you'd be able to pick up each individual bit. <laughs> Whether you can pick up the whole thing assembled is a completely different question. <laughs> Um, if you have a look for um, online for amateur satellite systems, you'll be able to see lots of pictures. Um, s there's at least one guy over in the US who's actually got a converted anti-aircraft gun mount that he mounts it on. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Uh, okay, hang on a minute. I'll find somewhere to plug this in, and then that, and then I'll plug that in. <laughs> With this help. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Battery's still working. Surprise when I didn't find one, that's all. All right, well, we'll... This is wrong. We'll just... I was going to say, would a, would, a, would a solar tracker do? That's because I just need a web browser. There you go. Good man. Thank you very much. Now, my excuse is that school holidays, school holidays m always make me lose time. Can I just use that function there? So, uh, my excuse is that I actually thought today was last Friday. <laughs> that was my problem. Oh, it's not actually gone there, has it? Yeah, no. Oh, the link didn't go, take me where I wanted to go. Go, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. Does it? Have you? Oh, I haven't actually tried that yet. I have to quickly look. Well, <coughs> you can leave the room now. You know it all, Mr. Smarty Pants. The, um, the other day, right. I was just looking around, as one does, and found this piece of software called Prey which, as I just pointed out, you can install on your Android phone as well. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it does, and then I'll explain to you why I think it's a bit weird simultaneously. Um, you install it on your laptop, somebody nicks it, you can attempt to find out where it is. You can hide it so that they don't know it's there, and um, you can even talk to them and contact them and video them or photograph them, at least if your laptop has a, a camera enabled. So it's actually pretty good. But the other p part that I find, and every time I've read these things about people finding the MacBooks or whatever it is that have been lost and they've photographed the person who stole it, is that how the hell did they actually manage to switch the thing on and start using it in the first place? Now, that's what baffles me. I was like, no, obviously, they've got it so that they switch it on and it just works. Mm -hmm. And then this person goes, wow, and starts using it. And then they think, oh, it's clever. You know, I can track them down and take a photograph. But if the person is halfway intelligent, you're not going to get your laptop back. And that's what I find a little bit strange with this as well. Somebody would actually have, you could switch it on as soon as you get to a login screen, this is my understanding of the software, you get to a login, login screen, it will then start to send messages home to mummy and daddy. So they don't actually have to log in. But if you have a laptop and you've got, I don't know, a BIOS password enabled, and I can guarantee um, 
I have spent a lot of time in courts with offenders of various types, and I can guarantee that most of them are not remotely interested in trying to work out how to get past a bias password. They'll either just dump the thing in a bin or in the river or in a skip or something like that, or they'll give it to a med of theirs who may be or may not care, or they'll just strip it for parts and use it for something else. So all that said, Prey is actually really good. You get this nice little web, <laughs> web interface where you can actually try to track it and get a map and take images of the person, etc., etc., etc. So it's good in the terms of, it appears to be good in the terms of what it does. I have not lost my laptop yet. I'm not intending to leave it around just to practice either, which would be fun if it was somebody else's laptop. But, I, but all of those sorts of software solutions for laptops I find a bit strange. Even with Prey, they actually recommend that, and it works on um, Windows as well as uh, GNU and Linux. Um, <clears throat> they recommend having a, a visitors type of login that it just automatically, as soon as you switch the machine on, it automatically logs into the visitors um, uh, user space, and that way that person will then start using the machine, and that way then you can track them. I don't know about that myself. <laughs> But if you're looking for something that you want to run on your machine just in case and, and you can overcome all those sorts of weird thoughts about why it would actually be useful, I'd su definitely suggest giving it a go. And as Shradar's just pointed out, it will actually now work on um, Android phones too. Is it phones? Yes. Yep. yep. Now, I just want to go back to the the other one. Like I, have I, said, had my, I have had a laptop stolen. Have you? Um, it's a bit rough. And I suppose you do feel that you'd like to know. I mean, people will open Absolutely. up to you, but you'd like to know what they're doing, what they look like. Or <laughs> if they aren't, I mean, in actual fact, it's the data that is sensitive. It's that it's been dumped, which has to be released, that it's not being used. My, uh, seriously, my, my experience of working with juvenile offenders, uh, and they, are, they comprise a large number of of uh, persons who break into homes and see all the things that can be lifted up and taken easily is that if they switch it on and it just doesn't look familiar or easy to use, dump it. They'll just get rid of it. They may try, they may take it into a hawk shop and see if they can get something for it. Person switches it on if they are remotely interested in actually ethically dealing with their clientele, and they'll won't buy it. But, but you know. Exactly. Mm. But it's it's the exposure you feel. I mean, it was my laptop was quite new. Mm. It's now if I was, I'd be even more protected. You feel yeah. more exposed. Yeah, my my understanding again, like I said, working with juvenile offenders in particular, and I've had some experience with adult offenders, not as for their offending behaviour. If it's not straightforward, they just get rid of it. They may have a mate who they give it to, but seriously, has anybody ever tried to jump the battery on a laptop? to try to reset the BIOS password. It's a pain in the ass, isn't it? It's not something you can, like a desktop, you just take the side off and off you go. But with a laptop, you've got to start dismantling the thing. Uh, most of them just don't well, care. With a desktop, it's not that easy. That's right, yeah. yeah. Most people just don't care. They get it, they get to their friend's house, they go, Mike, look at this, I've got this. <coughs> they go, oh, crap, what's this? And they will chuck it, get rid of it, drive down the street, throw it out the window. Like I said, they'll give it to a friend, you'll strip it down for bits and pieces that they might want and sell them on to other people. But generally, your data's pretty secure in that's that sense. Good. Yeah. That's the good thing if they've dumped it. Yeah. So. Yeah. As long as, like I said, you don't just give them an easy opening. What phones do we have? Oh, well, this is the next one. I found this by accident. I, I just like to trawl around looking for stuff. It's a um, how to design your own home in 3D. I and mean, seriously, it works really well. I could use it. I'll give you an example of what I did in, t in, in downloading it, starting to run it, what I made in the f those first five minutes, I'll show you. So if you actually spend any time with this piece of software, but it lets you make uh, 3D images of uh, internal elements of a house. Walls, carpets, lights, TV, you know, put your own little TVs and fridges in, you can make multiple rooms, you can do the outside as well and look at it, you can change all the sort of textures to things that you want. I actually started thinking I'd better stop using it because you know those things that just five hours later you haven't fed the kids, um, <laughs> your wife's going to be home, you haven't done the washing, you haven't done anything, you start thinking yeah no I better stop this now. But um, I found this, there was a really good review in the Softpedia Linux Weekly and it started out with a bad, mm. can get really cumbersome to work out, uh, to work with dealing with large objects. It depends on the, on the processing and RAM available to you really. 
Um, I've got a four, uh, uh, quad core machine with six gig of RAM, so it was pretty okay. But I think as you go to a lower end machine, it's gonna chew through it more slowly. Um, and they said it was harder to, uh, harder to maneuver as more objects are introduced in the project. I don't know, I didn't get that many in there. Um, it lacks an easy mode for users. I didn't find that at all. I thought it was pretty straightforward myself, not particularly difficult. Uh, the good stands out with its ability to view the projects in 3D at any given moment from a first person perspective. It's true, it's pretty good. The controls are intuitive. So there's no beginner's easy thing, but the controls are intuitive. Not sure if that's a contradiction or not. Um, users can actually get to walk through their houses long before they've been built, which is true. I didn't actually design my dream home. I didn't spend enough time with it. Um, and I'll give you an example of, I'd, I'd read the reference. If you look at my blog, you'll actually be able to find a link directly to it. Um, like I said, I wasn't even going to be here tonight because I my wife rang me up and said, aren't you going to the meeting? Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I lost a week. So I drove here quickly and then caught the tram and then missed my stop and then missed it again. Uh, let's see this starts. Here you go. This is li literally, this took me five minutes from actually starting it to fiddling and playing with it. You know these fantastic pan and scans with a camera that can zoom in. I was trying to get it to actually come back in on itself. I couldn't work that out. Oh, uh, hang on a sec. Does it have a full screen option? Yes. There we go. I'll just go back. See if I can drag it back. Go. Oh, where's my mouse? Uh, hang on. There we go. Start it again. There you go. Well, it took a bit of a while to render this. You can see there's a bit of wall missing under that window. But don't mind, you know, it was just a quick job. But it's really, really interesting. This was the video that's created inside the application. It churns through, and you can do it in different resolutions, it's up to uh, high definition. Does it have shadows? Um, yes, yes, from outside. I'm pretty sure. I saw something about shadows, but then again, it may have been just about shading. Oh, right. I don't, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I suppose though you'd have to design the house next door first. <laughs> you'd have to design the house next door first, <laughs> at least a wall, and then design your wall to see what the shadow would be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's look seriously. It was dead easy to use. It was a lot of fun, and I think that if you are. Uh, um, I've got some ideas already about using it for some videos. Actually creating a room, creating a house, and then having a video running on an L a TV inside of that room, and then you would zoom in across, come in, and you go straight into that video, and then that would form the presentation, like a birthday present or something that you were making for somebody. It would be interesting to do. But those are the two things that I had available for you tonight. Thanks, everybody. No, no, it's not at all. <laughs> or a Python concept. I didn't. <laughs> Chew your food. Yeah, that's right. Chew your food. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll just build upon what Patrick was saying because, um, well, let's see, is that. Uh, there we go. So Prey is there. I've got Prey installed on my phone, and I haven't lost my phone yet, so I don't know how well it works. Um, but it installs and it seems to work. And there's a, there's a, f um, now, Prey itself is free software, but they've got some kind of paid service. So I think that's their, that's their business model. Um, by default, if you're using their servers, you get up to I think three devices you can track, and that could be that could be computers or phones or whatever you like. It's cr it's cross-platform. There's tiny little icons there. Let's see, that's an Apple one, and there's a Windows, Linux. Ubuntu apparently isn't Linux, <laughs> and um, Android. Um, now, um, the the idea came up of losing your data. Um, you use, and I, I have this problem. I, I had my I had my netbook nicked um, a, 
a while back and um, I wasn't thinking I initially I was ticked off about losing losing the machine but I was really more annoyed about losing the information um, and there are two two things you can do about that I think firstly firstly you want to protect the information on there so if someone wants to get into the get into the um, the files on there um, they can't so um, well, you can encrypt your file system. That's a way to go. Um, um, the main distributions in Linux these days have fairly easy ways to encrypt. Um, I'll give you one piece of advice, though. If your swap is not encrypted, then your files are not protected because swap is basically memory. If you open a file, it goes into memory. If it's in swap, then it's written to disk. So your swap needs to be encrypted as well. Now, that's going to have a, a detrimental impact on your system performance and on a laptop, it's going to affect your battery life. So that's something you need to need to be aware of. If you've got um, a slower disk, like one that's solid state, then that's that's going to be hit particularly hard because um, solid state disks tend to be slower with writes, particularly the cheaper ones. Um, so that's that's the main thing. Another thing I do is I, I use a cloud storage service. Now there are lots of them around. Um, um, there's there's one that seems quite popular called Dropbox. Um, I think they they kind of popularized the idea. I personally wouldn't recommend them if you read the press about them lately regarding their terms of service and their their cl their, their claims about supposed security. Um, the one I use after um, having done a lot of searching, and I'm quite happy with it, is called Spider Oak. Now this is not free software, so be warned about that. Um, but as far as interacting with the free software community, the company seems pretty good. They give a fair amount of code back. Uh, they're also good about not just being a GUI product. Um, they have command line tools, so you can run it on servers and stuff like that. You get two gigabytes for free, and I found that's plenty for, for what I typically do. Um, and so I've got that. I've, I've got my files on my laptops and my home workstation all synchronized, which means that um, if I'm coming home from work and I can't be, can't be bothered packing up my laptop and lugging it on the train, I just leave it on my desk and then get home and sit at my workstation and resume where I was. It's, it's pretty good. Um, and all, you, all you're really doing is that you're designating some uh, directories on your system to be synchronized with the cloud and then it just does it. You just save your files and then um, it's, it just happens all transparently. So you move to, you move to another computer and the files are, the files are updated. Um, obviously there are bandwidth issues. You want, a, you want a reasonable amount of bandwidth to get those files um, up and down. But uh, again, I've used, my, I've used my laptop over my mobile phone and I never really had much of a problem. But it depends on the file sizes you're dealing with as well. Um, yeah, so that's that. Those would be my two recommendations. So, so security, encrypting your files, and having some sort of on, online uh, backup service. Any questions? Yep. On the flip side of what was going on, the, the tracking system, don't you feel uncomfortable that who can track you while you're using your own phone? Yeah, good question. And considering that. And, you know, the code might be open, but the service itself is proprietary. Um, it's not like I, c I don't think you can run your own prey server. In which case, um, it might be it might be a worry. I mean, these phones, that, uh, the mod modern smartphones, have all kinds of tracking systems in them, and there's been stuff coming out recently from the US um, where um, security services, police, and so on have have basically admitted that they use um, GPS and so on in telephones to track people. I mean, it's been long, long suspected. It's pre pretty much accepted, but it was never officially recognised. And it's come out into the open lately. So, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure that I'm sure that stuff happens in Australia as well. Um, Yeah, and that was a long time ago. That was back in the eighties. So that, that those would have been analog mobile phones. Yeah, it was much easier then. But for a long time, GSM was considered 
uncrackable, but um, it's as we've seen recently with News News Corporation, um, it's doable. But there are um, you, you you look at some of the um, some of the laws passed in, for instance, the U.S. I'm not sure about Australia. Uh, we don't get enough press about this sort of stuff. But um, some of the supposed anti-terrorism type laws say that they can do warrantless wiretapping, um, which is basically a blank check for them to to spy on you. On someone. Yeah. Just spell check and you don't use. <laughs> spell check and you don't use. <laughs> <laughs> no, she just been picking up all our spelling errors. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, do you know any any other like businesses posture that you can set up for the company and do the same thing? As in tracking your tracking your devices and things. I think there are. I think there are some, but this is a good website, by the way. If anyone's interested, if I got the URL correct. Um, this is good because um, what you do, what you do on this site basically is it you pick a program that you want an alternative to yeah. and it will have a list. So in this case I'll type spider oak. There you go. So Dropbox is the top one. Ubuntu one is uh, something that's rolled into Ubuntu. The the server side is proprietary, though, I believe. Um, and it's very annoying the way it sort of keeps trying to get you to use it. They kind of push it on you, don't they? Yeah. If I go free and open source. Now, I think in to this website, free and open source means freeware and open source. That's the impression I got. Uh, well, drop. Yeah. See, there you go. Look, Dropbox. Free with limited functionality. There's no way it's actually free software. Uh, Ubuntu one, same thing. And then this is the problem: the, the the client might be free software, but it will be dependent on a server that is not. That's and th that's the revenue model of a lot of these companies. Look, Windows Live for crying out loud. SkyDrive, voila, Box.net. Um, Oh, yeah, that's right. I looked into that some years ago. It was kind of abandoned, and then some other company picked it up, and then I didn't hear about it again. It seemed really interesting, though. They had some, some really cool stuff in there. Um, I believe it was written in .NET, though, for the mono platform. I don't, that, that might bother some of you. <laughs> um, yeah, well, there's a whole lot here. I mean, I don't know what the licensing is on all of them. Oh, there we go, iFolder. Um, I think that one's completely free software, from my knowledge. Yeah, something from ASUS. Well, you know, there's a lot. Um, there's one I've heard of. I don't know if it's proprietary or not, but it seems to be doing the rounds lately called Sparkle Share. Um, it de and also depends on what sort of thing you're after. Like iFolder, I believe, is um, was designed to be a corporate type thing. Spider Oak is more for technical people who really, really want um, security. Um, that's one reason why I chose it. Dropbox was just made to be simple. 
for people who just want simplicity and they don't give a crap about anything else. Um, even their privacy. Yeah, that's, that's it from me. Okay, so I'll give you... I'll give I'll give you an example. So some of some of these services require a password to log in, and that's all well and good. But the information when traveling over the wire between you and the server is not encrypted often, which means that it can be intercepted. That if if you're on a if you're on an untrusted network, someone can sniff the traffic, that sort of thing. Um, in some cases, the, the the company that's hosting the service claims to to value your your security and privacy, but they'll have um, you, you can you can somehow tell that they're that they're not like uh, um, if you read the terms of service for Dropbox, they basically they on on one hand on their features list they say we encrypt on everything, and in their terms of service they say we reserve the right to hand your information over to authorities, and so on. And the thing is, if your information was truly encrypted, they wouldn't be able to read it to hand it over. But so you yeah, I suppose. That's a, it's a good sure, question. Stuff, yeah. Do you hold the key or are they encrypting it on their server as No, that's that's a really, really good question because that that um, that determines whether they can unencrypt it or not. Um, now one reason why I went with Spider Oak was that it's encrypted locally and it's stored encrypted on their end and they have no way of of cracking it. And the authorities won't I mean, from what I understand with encryption is the authorities it's illegal to have any encryption that they can't break. So basically that's how it's covered. No, 